Bertram Project, music and storytelling that brings the spirit of climbing to honor the past. My name is Matt Spawn. Um, I run Stonewall's Climbing Gym in Beaverton, and super unprepared for this today. So we're gonna just um, do some quick stories, and then I'm gonna read some poetry, and hopefully that'll be fun. Um, but I guess I could start um, a lot of places. I've been a member of the climbing community uh, in Portland here for about 26 years, long time. I met Jim when I was a teenager, um, and my friend Chris Hill took me out uh, to Beacon, and Chris Hill was one of the first sort of teenage phenoms in the country back in the early 90s. And he would pick me up from school when I was first in eighth grade and then in high school. I would just ditch school and go climbing with Chris. And uh, I'd see Jim out at Beacon. And my experience was that they would <clears throat> just push you in, into pretty dark places, but really exciting places. So my first time trad climbing, uh, or multi-pitch climbing was at Beacon uh, with Chris Hill, and he just handed me the rack on the second pitch and told me to start climbing. And I had no idea how to place gear, um, and he would shout up at me and just say, just look at it, if it's in the crack, it's good. And, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And um, those, that's sort of how climbing started for me. Um, my dad would take me out as a, uh, as a kid when I was, you know, seven, eight, nine, and tie me to a tree. Um, and the rule was that the leader doesn't fall, um, except for my dad used to fall a lot. And so, you know, there's these strange sort of dichotomies and mixtures of, of thoughts and feelings that came for climbing with me as a young boy. Um, and those evolved. And I think one, one or two things that have been instilled in me um, is as I've grown older from, from the generation before is, is to remain humble uh, as a climber um, and also progression. And I think progression in my mind um, is sort of, can be sort of resembled with Jim. Uh, I went out to Beacon to start pushing the grades out at Beacon um, in the mid 2000s and and I met resistance with a lot of the local climbers, uh, either for trying to free the routes or for even putting in bolts. And Jim was always there uh, wanting to see the sport progress as it was and for the grades to keep moving up. And he would show me lines. He'd literally help me find lines to wrap down and say, hey, that's an old A line that's been aided once or twice. You should free that. You should do that. And he was always there being super supportive and encouraging the growth of the sport. Um, and that sort of progression we see uh, everywhere. I mean, we see it from just modern climbing with Tommy and Kevin doing the Donwall and then Adam Andre doing it in a week. You know, it took them eight years. And, and that progression is important. And that only comes with mentors who, who encourage it and allow you to grow. I'm sort of stuck in maybe too humble of a phase because of my dad. He, um, he always said that you had to build a base um, and that even if you climb a 5'10", you can't call yourself a 5'10 climber uh, because there's millions of 5'10s out there and you're bound to fall off of one of them. And I sort of uh, say that's sort of been a detriment to my climbing because I only climb a certain grade over and over and over again and I sort of am too scared to move on. But I think that sort of humble nature is really important with climbing. Um, just because in our sport, um, I think arrogance and sort of brashness can get us in trouble a lot of times. Um, and and I, I've seen it. I've seen and helped with rescues where people get in over their head. Um, and, and that sort of thought that we have to, you can never be solid at one grade has always stuck with me and always made me really sort of happy and excited because I think that if you climb 512, a lot of the times you don't want to get on 5.9s or 5.10s and you're missing out on a wide variety of climbing. Um, or if you're a sport climber, you don't trad climb. Or if you're a boulder, you don't sport climb. And I think to be a climber, you should experience all of it. Um, and I think that's been really important for me. Um, and with that, I mean, I, I think, yeah, so that progression and staying humble is really important. And I liked what Alana said about friendship, too, is, 
is it's really easy in, in climbing in particular to sort of sever those ties with friendship. Um, but it's, it's sort of a sport too that creates these deep bonds. Um, and so I, I brought some stuff to read. And um, this next one is, is going to be, it's, it's about friendship. Um, and it's being published, it's sort of a precursor. I'll probably get sued for this because it be in the next issue of Climbing. Um, but it's all I had. I didn't really plan for this. So, so this is about a climbing trip I took to Mexico with my friend Josh Wharton. Um, and, and both of us were dealing with loss at the time. And we we're uh, the whole idea of the article is what happens when you remove climbing from friendship or a, a friendship from climbing either way. And is climbing the only thing that sustains it for us? Are we just going out because we have a partner and they're there? So what I've decided to do is just read the first couple of sections, and then you have to buy the magazine so that the lawsuit won't be that big, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so um, OK, so here we go. Uh, this takes place in Mexico. Um, and it's, again, with my friend Josh Wharton. The teenage Federale slings his machine gun over his shoulder and bends towards my bag. Cocaine, he asks, marijuana. I have five ounces stuffed in an ibuprofen container in the outside zipper of my backpack. No, I say. Josh stands behind me. He doesn't know about the stash. What about this, the youth asks. He holds up a mess of quick draws, locking carabiners, and a few cams. Vamos a Escalar and Basisiachi, I say, having rehearsed my only Spanish on the flight between Portland and El Paso. See, he smiles, opening the cooler and pulling out an apple. I'm sweating and tense, but no one notices. I'm the only one who knows about the weed. The teen sniffs the apple and then searches through my bag of diabetic supplies, shooting some insulin out of a preloaded insulin pen and grinning. Esta? Diabetes, Josh says. His beige Sienna minivan is the only vehicle at the military checkpoint being searched. Other soldiers loiter around, smoke cigarettes, and flag cars through. See, uh, Quantos horas a basisiachi, Josh asks. He's been making small talk and knows about as much Spanish as I do. Siete, the youth says, standing up and adjusting the machine gun, which is polished in early morning light and gleaming. Bien, he says. The teen waves us back onto the highway, sweat blooming on his shirt, dark rose cart ink blocks spreading from under his arms and across his chest as the heat of Mexico is a forewarning for all. He shouts after us, no conduzca por la noche. I have no idea what it means. A flock of birds flies overhead and disappears behind a low hill, beyond which the scorched brown desert stretches to the horizon. Josh and I made plans to climb in Yosemite Valley, but two weeks prior to this trip, winter storms dumped several inches of snow that threatened more. The valley is shit, he said in an email. I'm down with Vegas as plan B, but I'm worried it might be too warm. What about logical progression? Looks great, I emailed back, knowing nothing of the climb or the pervasive crime in the Chihuahua state. What I did know was that if one of the best all-around climbers of our generation wants you to go on a climbing trip, then you don't say no. It's bound to be filled with excitement and palm-sweating moments. And so we found ourselves driving south through Ciudad Juarez and into a sun-soaked landscape. That was close, Josh says. I have a bunch of weed, I admit. <laughs> well, fuck, he says. At least you kept your shit together. He cracks the window and laughs. We continue driving deeper into the epicenter of Mexican drug trade, kidnappings, and murders, into a land filled with loss and men with guns. We've come to try a route called Logical Progression in Basisiachi National Park. It's a difficult route, mainly a 512, climbing with three pitches of 513 and a few of 511, and the wall is aptly named El Gigante. Doing some pre-travel research, I found that the climb and area around it are shrouded in conflict. After the first ascent by Bert Van Lint and Peter Baumister, which took place after they rat bolted the entire wall, the fam famous climbing duo of Alex and Thomas Huber threatened to chop the route. Yet after Arnaud Petit and Stefan Glawitz repeated the climb, they claimed it was one of the best big walls they'd ever done. The accusations against the first ascensionists of bad style, as well as the threats to chop the route, simply faded. Then in 2010, Alex Arnold and Sonny Trotter worked the route and climbed it in a day, but not without trouble. Our first attempt was hampered by a combination of technical climbing on complex volcanic tuff and a few broken holes, forcing them to bivy on Critter Ledge, atop pitch 18, before finishing the following day. 
Sonny added that small tidbits of info about his and Honnold's fear of the drug traffickers and the armed farmers growing crops at the base of the wall. But as we drive the but as we drive the main highway between Ciudad Juarez and Chihuahua, passing a few military checkpoints where men with armored jeeps holding machine guns, <coughs> I wonder how the black Escalades with tinted windows keep driving through without being stopped. <coughs> At the forefront of our thoughts is Hyden Kennedy's death. The day we sent Logical Progression was published on Evening Sends less than a month before he died. In it, he writes about climbing logical progression with three friends, two of which passed away in separate accidents not long after the group climbed the route. He writes of the joy and adventure of climbing as well as its strange and canny nature, its irreversible attachment to death and loss. I am still in the process of finding my own path, and I'd be lying if I said these deaths haven't affected its direction. How does climbing fit into real life? If we only take the surface level experience, endlessly chasing the next hardest project, the next most futuristic alpine objective, then in my opinion, climbing becomes too much of a selfish pursuit. I never knew Hayden, but Josh knew him well. They were good friends who climbed peaks all over the world together, including one which earned Hayden and Kyle Dempster the pilot de or. Josh was on the climb, but forced to stay at high camp, suffering from edema and fighting for his life. He never received an award. I read Hayden's story a week before his death, and as we drove, it made me think about my friendship with Jade, a climbing partner who'd recently bailed on me and severed our friendship for good. I don't have time for you anymore, she said. I don't have time for climbing friends right now. My friendship had never been defined like that. I'd always believed, however naively, people were just friends or not. How does one fit climbing into real life friendships? As Josh and I, as Josh drove and the hours went by, I thought about Hayden and Jade and Josh's loss and my own. Hayden's article reaffirmed my view that climbing creates deep bonds, but that we can also be, do fucked up things for the summit. It also made me think about another fact, how I like the intimacy of mountains, that knowing that if we stay there, we can die, and how this brings us together. But I know because of this fact that we can't remain in the mountains, and when we get back home, we go our separate ways, or often do that however intense our experiences, we must continue living our separate lives and moving along our individual paths, but that the mountains always remain. So that's the start of it, and it goes on a long time. <laughs> um, okay, um, I think we're sort of done. So my favorite climbing gear uh, is is the number two Metolius cam. Uh, and I think it's still stuck on a climb out of Beacon. Uh, <laughs> it hold me on my biggest whipper. Um, and then both my partner and I were too scared to climb back up to get it out. So <laughs> we just pulled her up. <laughs> okay. That's it.